Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got Luke. Luke, today we're talking about something that quite literally every civilization is interested in. You think? I think so, according to my research, and that okay. is wheat from the field to your table. I was going to say from the ground to my gut. Well, that's another way to look at it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into wheat being in the ground and getting into your gut, I thought we should talk about some history. Did that surprise you? It does not because like, like I would bet if you weren't a famous podcaster mm -hmm. that you would be a historian. Like I could see myself as Indiana Jones, you know, like I'm teaching kids in college and then they come knock on my door and they're like, James, we need you to go discover I, the Holy Grail. Up until that point, I'm with you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So All let's right. Let's hear some history. Wheat. It turns out it's a cereal grain. So mm. that's something. Okay. Uh, it originally comes from the Levant region uh, in the Near East and Ethiopian highlands. Okay. Who knew? Uh, but it's spread throughout time now, and it's basically cultivated worldwide. Two fun facts for you, Luke. Shoot. Wheat is grown on more land area than any other commercial food. I saw that. That's pretty interesting. I have right? some stats at the end that I got Ooh, from nice. some wheat statistics and facts dot like org or something. Is it's that what it was? Wheat statistics and facts yeah. <laughs> org? That's amazing. <laughs> Whoever runs that website's a genius. I love it. Um, fun fact too. Shoot. Wheat is also the most traded crop much greater than all trade of other crops combined. I mean, if you think about it, it's literally, it, it's the building block of like so many things that we consume. Like, yeah. you know, bread and pizza and cereal. It's, it's added as thickeners. And I mean, wheat's in literally like just about everything. It's, it's kind of crazy. Like not even like, like everybody thinks wheat, you think of bread, but it's, it's literally everywhere. You're old. Do you eat cream of wheat? Oh my goodness gracious. So here, let me, here's my, so I grew up eating cream of wheat. Oh goodness. And I'm my gross. grandma, my grandma had this way of making it where you would make it and you wouldn't stir it and okay. you'd get these lumps oh. and you'd pour warm milk on top of it and put butter and cinnamon in it oh, and some sugar. Oh my goodness. Like literally it's like bringing tears to my eye thinking of my grandmother. Uh, but oh, sorry oh, about that. It was, uh, I, I love cream of wheat. I grew up, I grew up eating it. Gross. Okay, let's go back to history. Oh, 6,000 BC. Did you 6, see that? 6,000 BC. What was 6,000 BC? 6,000 BC was In the Egypt? earliest, I believe it's uh, archaeological, archaeological Arche evidence. Archaeolo Arch I'm oh, Arche <laughs> I'm <kidding>. Archaeolo. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Our, like, res our resident about? lexicon didn't know where I was going. Gotcha, so the gotcha. earliest archaeological evidence of a wheat seed being crushed uh, between millstones goes all the way back to 6,000 BC. That is that is ridiculously old. Yeah, I saw that they found they found twelve thousand years ago collected wheat, but that yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that it was ground up to be processed in any mm -hmm. way. But yeah, and so it took a while for them to figure out how to make it something more useful. But you're right, six thousand years of crushing up grain or of cr crushing up wheat. That's pretty impressive. That is very impressive. Um, I saw. Around that time, Cyprus and India were doing it. Egypt were, was doing it. Maybe a thousand years later, Germany and Spain got in on this grinding stuff up mix or kick. And then uh, wheat reached England and the Scandinavian, like Scandinavia um, and the Nordic countries. Then shortly after in like 3000 BC, you know, shortly after. Shortly. So, uh, until the 19th century, though, like early on in the 19th century, growing and harvesting wheat didn't really differ a whole lot from how they did it like six or 8,000 years before, right? Um, farmers had to harvest the wheat by hand with a sickle, which just sounds terrible uh, because you have to plant a whole lot of this stuff to get yeah. any any results right uh stocks were tied by hand into bundles and weighted the threshing and so they basically would just like beat this stuff off of the ground uh put it in a bag and beat it or something like that to kind of get all of the different parts to separate and we can talk about that process later on a little bit um, so none of the process changed up until 1834. And that's when a reaping machine was patented by Cyrus McCormick, longtime listener, good friend of the show, and an American inventor. 
you know, maybe he could be good for an episode. Is this the cat that McCormick Spices is named after you? So I'm, I have that in my notes. Do you think he's what McCormick Spices or McCormick and Schmicks is named after? What's McCormick? Is that the seafood joint? Yeah, it's a restaurant. Like maybe, and maybe that's named after the spices. Uh, What do I know? Who knows? Yeah, but anywho, uh, that same year was the invention of the threshing machine as well. So the machines made harvesting way faster. You can have way more land with way more wheat on it uh, to do all this good stuff. Then the steam engines of the 1880s showed up and the internal combustion engine, of course, that I think we've even done episodes on. We have. um, Of the 1920s replaced all the horses and cattle and things like that that would be used to pull the machinery originally. Uh, And so that made things even faster and more efficient for them, of course. Um, On top of that, though, like it was all well and good, right? We got this wheat, we're turning it into things. That's great. We can make bread. But what made the crop extra, extra popular is that in 1928, the toaster was invented. (laughs) The the toaster and the automatic, automatic bread slicer. So I guess in 28, the slicer was made in 1930, the toaster was made. And honestly, that invention or the two inventions made it so that we could turn bread into something that is more useful and we'd be able to toast it. So people started using it for breakfast all over the place. And it totally was a game changer, which I guess the greatest thing since sliced bread really applies yeah. here. Right? So here's so fun fact about me. I only do peanut butter and jelly sandwiches nowadays on toasted What's that bread. Mean? Oh, oh, so you eat other foods, but if you're going to have peanut butter and jelly. It has to be toasted. What kind of jam do you use or Half, jelly? Has to be strawberry. Psychopaths use, strawberry? use grape. Yeah, it has to be strawberry. What about raspberry? Eh, any berry, I'm good. What about with. Just, preserves? I'm, I like preserves better. I like when all the bits and pieces are in it, but I'm not a grape jelly fan. It, yeah. it all goes back to that lumpy cream of wheat, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, that's about where I ended my history. I kind of felt like stuff just stopped happening after that. It kind of did. I mean, it really just became a progression of technology at that point and making things faster and quicker and, you know, bigger production facilities. Um, I do think we need to pay a little homage to the kernel homage. of wheat itself, don't you? Oh, uh, 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 yeah, of course. Okay, so whether you realize this or not, like, I, I think, I know I had this assumption probably when I was a little kid and probably probably up until I did the research. Up until yesterday, episode. right? Um, <laughs> that, you know, wheat, they just crush it. Boom, you got flour. Oh, no, right. no, no, James. No, so, no, no, uh, Luke. So there's this thing. It's it's cons- it's called a wheat berry in some terms. So it is. Uh, when you look at like the wheat itself, like a picture of it, there's those little things that literally look like really small berries, a whole bunch of them. Each one of them is considered a wheat kernel. And that wheat kernel is comprised of three primary um components. The first one is the brand. So this is the exterior, the brown part. Uh, This is almost always uh, secondary, but when you see like wheat bran or bran as a thing, that is, that's what that portion is. So like in wheat bran, it's left in some whole wheats whenever they grind it. Um, But uh, that is typically about um, 14% of the total of a single wheat berry. You have it broken Uh, down by percentage. I do. Uh, Moving to the inside, then that's the exterior. Moving to the inside uh, is the endosperm. So this is the primary, (laughs) this is the primary, it makes up 83% of the kernel uh, by weight. And the endosperm is where all of the wheat that you and I think of comes from. That's predominantly the major portion of it. Um, And this is where all of the soluble fiber comes from. And this is where some of the vitamins and minerals that are inside of it naturally uh, occur. And then the final piece is the germ. It's really small. It only makes up about small, makes up about 2% of the overall weight. Uh, And this is the actual sprouting embryo that happens and remains inside of that seed. And this is almost always um, like a byproduct. Uh, inside of uh, the milling process. So so that is the anatomy, we'll call it, of a kernel of wheat. 
Well done. Fun fact for you, Luke, and you kind Shoot. of alluded to this. A loaf of brown bread has all of those parts that you just mentioned. So all of the parts go into the flour when it's ground up. White bread is made up of only the endosperm, mm -hmm. making it really rich in proteins and carbohydrates. And for this reason, brown bread is considered to be healthier than white bread. Did you know that it's illegal in, I think, most of Europe to actually enrich um, flour? So in I the United States, like a lot of the flour we consume, you can see it or bread or cereals that says enriched flour. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm almost positive I'm getting this right because of just the way their, you know, food and drug administration, whatever it is, it's actually illegal to enrich it with extra vitamins. Like we put in like B12 and niacin and all kinds of things to make it All healthier. the things that make your teeth healthy. Exactly. <laughs> That's not nice, Luke. Jeepers. Sorry. Oh. Um, oh, yeah. and you were you were being rude. I see. What you I was. Were, I didn't realize what, what I did you were then. doing there. Sorry. Yeah. No, that is interesting, though. I didn't know that was the case. Mm -hmm. um, other things I didn't know is that it's time for a word from our sponsor. I have to assume it's the American Wheat Council. I was thinking like King Arthur or oh, something like that. I love but... me some King Arthur. Yeah. Is, uh, is that your go-to for baking, or you don't is, care really? It is my go-to for baking. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Me too. Um, but we don't have a sponsor, oh. so sorry about that. We do have a couple of shout outs, though, we which got? is even better than a sponsor. It is. Um, we have Jake K. He wanted to know if we'd cooperate with him about his website that sells civil engineering merchandise. Uh, head over to www.engineer-merch.com. E-N-G-I-N-E-E-R-M-E-R-C-H. And you can browse their like cool t-shirts and mugs and socks and other stuff that have witty engineering stuff associated Interesting. with them. Yeah, I feel so like we might steal that stuff. idea and start doing it ourselves. Head over to Unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> Second shout out, and I apologize for getting your name wrong. I'm sure you'll nail it. Can <laughs> yeah. Kano Kanoa K found us on Spotify, likes listening to us rather than political shows or just music, because you know, we're just so very informative, right? We are. Um, also was asking for some suggestions on good part-time jobs a university student would have to help with engineering. I already gave my thoughts and expressed how important co-ops and internships are, but Luke, do you have any advice as to the kind of jobs one might be interested in? Uh, I, I think if you can do anything, um, I think people overlook the hands-on aspect of what you could do. So uh, even if it's just like working, like maybe some light construction or doing some kind of maybe habitat for humanity, like anything that gives you like basic fabrication principles, I think really benefit you later on when you become an engineer, when, it think, when you think about actually making things. So mm -hmm. whether it's volunteering, whether it's doing something in the summer where maybe you're doing some construction or anything hands-on that gets you working with pieces and putting them together, I think is probably the best thing you can do. Volunteering. I don't do anything unless I get paid for it, like this podcast. <laughs> God, right. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I think that was good, Luke, and pretty much in line with what I was thinking. I was like, machine shop. I wish I would have done something like that. Mm -hmm. Electrician would be amazing. Anything. Yeah, anything like that. All right. So uh, if you want to get a sweet shout out, if you want some amazing stickers, if you want to say hi, if you want to tell us that this weed episode is just the worst, whatever you think, why don't you email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And don't forget to yell at your smart device to play the Unprofessional Engineering Podcast and make sure that you like, review, share, uh, and make sure that uh, you always give us great reviews. There we go. Um, before we move on to how wheat is harvested, um, I did want to give a quick story of one of my friends texted last night and was like, hey, in the manual transmission episode, who was your friend that you were referring to, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, huh, I don't know. I don't remember <laughs> what we were talking about. Sorry about that. But just how quickly all of this leaves me. 239 head. episodes is a yeah. lot to try to remember. Yes, it is. Uh, all right. So how is wheat harvested? Luke, I was watching a video, Luke style, we call that. Nice. And this farmer was saying how he's running one of the smaller operations because he's harvesting just 2,000 acres of wheat. Oh, now, is that it? 
Yes. Now keep in mind, he also had hundreds of acres for animals and other things, but just 2000 acres of wheat and his neighbors who had bigger operations were looking at like 10,000 acres, which just seems a little unmanageable to me, but so be it. Um, I, so my stuff because of this video that I was watching was in Oregon. So that was kind of my point of reference. They were talking about, uh, they would plant the crop in October and it's then ready to harvest in July the following year. That being said, there is like a summer and a winter crop, right? So you're able to plant wheat at different times of the mm -hmm. year, and then you can have extra servings, like extra like harvests <laughs> of your <laughs> of your wheat. Uh, and apparently, they're considered to be different. They are so. So that's kind of interesting. Do you know why they're different? Uh, I would I would bet that just the climate and the temperature makes yeah, the makes, makes the the wheat berries like a either maybe more robust because they're in colder temperatures perhaps mm -hmm. uh, and actually you know fun so in uh, Lord of the Rings Sam Wise Ganji makes reference to the winter wheat is just coming into harvest so wow Luke mm -hmm. I am impressed. Dropping the Lord of the Rings Sorry. info on us. On the oh. wheat episode. You didn't think I could get that in there, did you? <laughs> That's beautiful. All right. Okay. So since we're in modern times now, we're not yes. out there with sickles chopping stuff down. What farmers do have to harvest the wheat is a combine harvester. This giant international harvester for all my country fans out there. Giant machines. They basically look like these huge giant tractors of death with this mm -hmm. big spinning contraption on the front of them that kind of like chops down the stalks as they roll past them. Mm -hmm. And it does a whole bunch of the, we'll say like the dirty work in there as well. So what it's tearing off, it's also kind of cleaning up throughout the process. And I think it's called pre-processing. It is called pre-processing, thank you. But it's kind of doing some of that thrashing and other stuff uh, along the way. And so alongside of our uh, combine harvester, there's going to be like almost like a dump truck or like a tractor pulling just this massive bin along mm -hmm. beside it, right? And so there's this giant pipe that sticks out of the harvester and shoots all of the good stuff uh, that it just harvested into this giant bin. Once this bin is all full of goodness, um, the thing has to stop, a new one has to get put in there, and they drive this thing off to get turned into flour. Basically, uh, that's it. They dump it into a giant storage area, and then we get into the actual flour making process. So it's super simple nowadays, I would say, to harvest stuff in comparison to thinking of all of these poor farmers standing out there with sickles slapping yeah, stuff down. Yeah, and, and, and a part of that is, so if you see these big silos, a lot of times, those, mm. you know, th those are filled with, in, in some cases, corn, but it could also be grain. Uh, when they harvest it, a big, a big part of, you know, after they harvest it and they do the pre-processing, they're getting rid of the big bits of uh, the wheat. Yeah. Um, they have to look at, the uh, the right moisture content, the weight. They have to check for impurities. They got to check for enzymes. They got to make sure uh, that there's no um, uh, bacteria or fungus because all of these things could happen. This stuff's obviously growing That's outside. Gross. They got to address um, the the quality of the wheat. And there's this thing called a ha hag hag burger falling number. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is a measurement um, that is used to measure the quality of the wheat. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that the there was a certain name for that quality. There was. But I appreciate it. Um, speaking of silos, when I was growing up, I had a Fisher, Fisher Price farm. It was red with and white, and it had this little thing that opened I, and I closed. Had the exact same one. And it had a silo, and inside of that, there was not wheat, but there was farm animals that I oh. stored in there. <laughs> that seems very James-like. It was very relevant to this episode. Fun fact, right. James. Let's hear it. I need a fun fact. 20, 2019 to 2020, mm -hmm. global wheat production. Let's hear it. 736.93 million metric tons. That, that's like mind boggling to that's me. That's 
that seems like a lot. Yeah. I don't know exactly how much that is. Like probably doesn't fit in my backyard though. I would, I would bet not. (laughs) That's unbelievable. Uh, A lot of people out there making a living doing this. Uh, Before we move on with more fun facts and how we turn this wheat into something useful, how about we take a break for this week's Luke's rant? All righty. So my rant is uh, Uh people that say that they can't eat gluten. And so there, there is legitimately something out there called like celiac. Me. No, yeah, me, like me. <laughs> so there's people out there that say, oh, I have celiac disease. And celiac is you have an intolerance to gluten. It messes up, you know, the, your stomach. And anytime you eat anything that has gluten in it, not just right. wheat, the gluten is in other types of grains. Mm-hmm. Um, you basically, you know, comes out of both ends. You don't feel good. You get rashes, all sorts of things. What it's, do you mean, terrible. both ends? <laughs> I think you know what I mean by oh, both ends. Okay. <laughs> Family show, remember, James? Oh, my bad. Uh, but the reality is, most people probably have a wheat allergy, not a gluten, where they tr- actually oh. have celiac. And the way you usually know the difference, uh, from what I understand, is. If you have a wheat allergy, it's typically more, um, it, it happens quicker. So if you eat wheat, you're gonna get a rash, you're gonna get hives, you're gonna have like a, a more immediate reaction. Celiac tends to be something where it, it's ongoing, you always mm-hmm. kind of have this and, and until you quit taking in gluten. Uh, but I have so many people that they just like, they're, uh, <laughs> there's this, this comedian that I uh, watch on YouTube every now and then, and he says how to be uh, gluten intolerant. And it's all about how to treat people that eat gluten because you can't eat gluten and it's just a, it, it, it's a really funny shtick that this guy does and it, it's all about being like you know super snobby about the fact that you don't eat gluten and all the things that gluten is bad at doing and stuff like that so yeah uh, so don't just say you can't eat gluten find out if you have a wheat allergy or if you have celiac they're two different things and there could be sensitivity levels and all kinds of stuff so don't just say you don't eat gluten what's your deal Mine is, I don't know. I'm being tested actually in two weeks. Who are you? That's so, exciting. Uh, so I just, you I could just double went, up and get your COVID vaccine and your test done at the same time. I could, but here's the cool thing. So I've been laying off wheat and gluten and I feel mm. good, but my doctor said you have to eat a lot of gluten before the test. So I'm getting oh, some darn. blood work. And so like I've been pounding bread for the last two days. So you're like, like, I have to, you just like keep stuffing it in your I face. I have to eat pizza and I have to eat bread constantly <laughs> for the next two weeks. Uh, sorry about that. Thank oh, you. that's funny. Okay. So so moving on to making flour, um, do you want to talk about this or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, so, uh, so once the flour has been harvested, once it's been stored and once they've assessed it, uh, there's a process called cleaning and conditioning. Uh, and what this does is this gets any of that extra debris that is inside of this. And there's lots of processes here. There, there's magnet, there's magnets that are used to get out any, you know, uh, metallic material. They, they use air processing to get out lighter pieces of it. Um, and they get it all the way down to the actual wheat berries themselves. So, so when you get down to this point, you've done the cleaning and conditioning, um, and this, this whole process takes somewhere up to about 24 hours to get just down to that wheat berry. Uh, then at this point, um, all of that cleaning conditioning has kind of prepared that wheat berry to now be processed. Now it goes into like what you think of like the grinding where it starts mm-hmm. to separate the brand, the endosperm and the, uh, What's, I just said it earlier, James, the brand, the endosperm, and oh my goodness, I can't, and the, uh, the germ, uh, from the germ, one that's the one. So, yeah. Um, so, so Real quick, like Luke, shoot. I don't think I did it justice back when we were talking about history and how things were done back in the day, but we talked about how you get your wheat flour. And like you said, you have to separate the wheat berry from the hull. And mm-hmm. That's the what threshing process, but then you need to winnow all of the, the shaft. Is that winnow? it? No winnow it away and so basically they showed like the harvesting process so like it looked like a total pain in the bum right so to pick the berries it was a very manual process for any of you 
because it's also like protected by the chef, which means you then have to like remove that casing from it mm-hmm. to get closer to the final product you want. If any of you have done any flower picking of your own, like in your basement, like that's all dark, like you would know more about this process. It's fine. Oh, but basically once it's done and you're starting to separate it, they would basically just use the wind and like you can toss it up in the wind and it would blow the stuff you don't want away that you broke free that was protecting the seed mm-hmm. and it would blow away and you would just be left with that seed that you actually care about. Yeah, but there's again, that, think about the time involved. Separating the wheat from the chaff is you know, yeah. kind of a saying people have heard and that's so that's what they would throw it up in the air and it would just blow away. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. Oh, no, you're good. Uh, so then what starts to happen is now that you're down to this final wheat berry, you start to run this through like like these reverse rollers. So imagine yeah. the wheat is coming down. You would think the rollers would like spin down. What they do is they spin the opposite direction and it actually peels the bran off and starts to separate um, the germ as well. Uh, once all of these rollers uh, or they, they, they call them breakers uh, have gone through crushing it and splitting it open. They actually separate uh, the white inner portions from the outer skins. And then that is then through air and all kinds of other sifting processes, the brand goes over to one spot and then the, uh, the germ and the wheat go over to another spot. Uh, once those are all separated, then, and, and then you have to get into, you know, fortification. So now that this has all been separated, now they start to add in. And again, I think uh, here's where I saw the UK. So the UK government says that, yeah, so it, it is currently illegal as of 2018 in this article. Oh, wow. Uh, for them to uh, fortify. So I'm, I'm oh, pretty you mean sure you that's know still accurate. In 2018, it was. Okay. Yeah. Not that it started in 2018. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, so they added nutrients like iron uh, and B vitamins, niacin uh, and thymine. Uh, then once that's all been fortified, uh, then they break that down into the multiple types of flowers. Uh, and I don't know if you had anything else before we talk about the types of flowers. Um, just one thing about that. So like you were saying, it goes through these giant rollers, um, smashing stuff up and whatnot. This used to be done by like windmills, right? Uh, windmills and water mills that mm-hmm. would then power these giant grinding wheels for the mills. Uh, check out our episode on windmills and wind turbines if you haven't done so already. Uh, but also in this process, as they're grinding up the wheat, and this is getting into the making flower part, they'll actually introduce different types of wheat to produce these different types of flour. Mm-hmm. Apparently this is called gristing and that made me think there's a brewery in Etna uh, in Pittsburgh called Grist House. So I wonder if that somehow is related. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Smarter than I thought they were. Anyways, continue on. One please. of my favorite places on earth, Holland, Michigan, has oh, a yeah. working windmill. It does. Uh, and we visited it and there's actually a lady there that runs it. I'm drawing a blank on her name. And she had to like go over to some place in Europe to be trained on how to run seriously the actual grind mill. And she's like one of the only women in the United States to have like this, I know how to make flower certification in an old timey. How mill. cool. You and I have been to Holland together a number of times and Multiple you never times. took me there. I'm sorry. It's You should go there. It's pretty cool. Okay. Um, so, uh, so there are multiple types of flowers. You talked about blending because there's, there's different types of wheat that they can turn into, um, you know, flour, but there's basically uh, a handful of types of flowers. So the one is uh, bread flour. So this one has uh, the highest protein uh, and it's typically used for making bread. Uh, the next one is Turkey. plain plain flour. Uh, so plain flour is like what you and I would call all-purpose flour here in the U.S. Uh, so all-purpose flour uh, is typically suitable for you know biscuits and scones and sauces and thickening and scones. And, and cakes things like that. Um, self-rising flour uh, typically has baking powder added to it so that it actually obviously self rises uh, because people don't know that baking powder has a rising effect uh, just like uh, yeast does. Uh, And then there's powder up baking soda out. Right. What's that? I never heard that before. Baking soda makes things spread. So if you're making, want to like a spreading chocolate chip cookie. Yeah. You would put the baking soda. I have never known that. There you go. All (laughs) righty. 
Uh, and then, uh, and then we talk, and then I talk about a little bit enriched flowers whenever they take flower. Uh, and here in the U.S., a lot of flowers enrich, and they go in and they add in different nutrients to it. So, did you know, Luke, that a lot of these bigger mills that we're talking about actually have a degreed milling scientist? Like they have, they go to school, and it's like big time education to know this science and art. Kind yeah, but I, but I imagine like that's a. <laughs> I can't imagine that's a big field because like how many companies oh, no, I need can't that imagine. person? And how many do you need, right? Yeah. I yeah. don't know, but we could find out. Um, anything else you want to talk about before we get into some fun facts? So uh, I have the all kinds of flowers you can make unless you were going to touch on that. I'm not touching. So we're going to talk about, so we've been talking about wheat flour, but you can literally make flour from like anything, acorn flour, almond flour, a Amerith, marinath flour, bean flour, rice flour, buckwheat, cassava, chestnut, chickpea, coconut, uh, corn, uh, corn peanut. Flour. I mean, there's yeah. so many, you know, rice, sorghum, tapioca, potato. I mean, pretty much anything you can dry out and grind, you can turn into a flour. It's mostly going to taste like rubbish compared to flour. Hence my, my rant the other day about gluten-free pizza. Um, so, uh, so just about anything can be flour uh, when you think of just basically grinding up any kind of grain. Uh, so, hmm. yeah. There we go. We're going to talk stats facts? and fun facts. Yeah, let's hear your stats and then I'll get okay. into some fun facts. So probably one of the most interesting um, facts that I saw was the global wheat consumption. So what do you think, Ooh. like which country do you think consumes? Maybe we'll play a game here. So what country do you think uh, consumes the most? Like what are China. the top three? How did you know that? Because it has a bajillion people. Okay, it does. Yeah, and, and it's it's pretty. So they are 135,000 <laughs> metric tons okay. uh, in one year. Uh, European Union comes in second at 185. Well, India comes in at uh, a little over, right under 100,000 uh, metric ton. U.S. is one, two, three. U.S. is in like fifth place. We only do 31,380 metric We're tons. We're only fifth. That really surprises me. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. What else do you got? Uh, we can go back and forth. I got, I got to pick okay. on these, these charts. In the United States, Luke, fun fact, 42 out of the 50 states grow wheat. That's pretty really? impressive, right? The wheat state, also known as Kansas, produces 20% of all the crop in the United States. Kansas isn't that big. So, I mean, that whole state must just be wheat, like the whole way across. I don't know. Do you have something else or should I keep going? Do you know that wheat isn't the most produced grain in the world? What is? Corn. They use it oh. for other things, for gas, for, 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 oh, for, for yeah. alternative fuels. Yeah. So corn is, uh, so this is 1 million metric tons. So 1.1 1, 1, 1. 1 million metric tons. No, that, that can't. I'm sorry, 1,116 million metric tons of corn. Uh, wheat, like I said before, is 764 million metric tons. Both pretty sizable. Pretty sizable. China is also the largest wheat producing country in the world, not just the most consuming. The crop grows between two and four feet tall, Luke, but some varieties can grow as tall as seven feet. That's impressive. Really? That's much taller than me. Four feet's almost about how tall I am. In so. the United in the United States, thirty seven point two million acres are used for harvesting. I saw something like five hundred forty four point six million globally are used. That's like, just the crazy. whole world is used to grow wheat. It's unbelievable. Every continent except Antarctica grows this crop to some extent. Hmm. Interesting. I have one last fun fact for you, Luke. Shoot. All wheat harvesting videos that you find on YouTube have the same banjo music playing in the background. Fact. Everyone that I listened to had like basically the same exact music in the background. Okay, James, I'm going to, I'm going to make a bet with you. One, two, three, four, five. If you can name three of the top five wheat producing States in the United States. states? Yeah. Wheat okay. producing States. If you can name three of the top five, I will give you 
twenty dollars. Kansas. Okay, that's one. <laughs> that was one. Um, okay, we're gonna go with Nebraska. Nope. How many guesses do I get? I'll give you. If, I'll give you five guesses for the top Nebraska's, five. So. Okay, so we got Kansas. I got Nebraska wrong. Oh goodness, Texas. Nope. Hmm. Uh, it's so big. Um, you got two more guesses. You got to get both about, right. How about uh, okay, Oklahoma? Uh, nope. Seriously, either okay. of the Dakotas? Uh, North Dakota is number one. Okay. okay. Kansas is number two. Montana is, which Montana. I wouldn't guess. Montana. Montana is number three, and Washington uh is number four and idaho is number five yeah i was not going to what about potatoes come on <sighs> apparently i don't know what they do <sighs> well i got one <laughs> you got that's one that's pretty bad that's all right <laughs> awesome anything else luke that's all i got all right well i think everybody's probably learned more than they've ever wanted to know about wheat i know i did your eating habits and everything else uh, if you would like to, to give us a great shout out and tell us what a great job we're doing or never to talk about wheat again email <laughs> us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com and until next time see ya